Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello, it's Dr. Gemma, and I am podcasting here from the Prius of Love, parked at Starbucks, and this is episode 130, and it is aptly called Bombshells, because that's what's happened this week. So, without much ado, I will give you the two biggest bombshells. The first bombshell is that the Cognitive Fiber Retreat is tentatively scheduled for November 11th and 12th, 2023. Actually, it will be on November 11th, the Saturday, but you know how these things spill over. If we can get 50 attendees and some willing vendors, we are going to make this happen. Please feel free to tell everybody you know, and if you have been to a CFR, one of the original eight, you know how wonderful it was. So please pass this on. Why is this bombshell being dropped? Well, you may notice that is the weekend that used to be Stitches Southwest or Stitches Southern California, whatever they ended up calling it. And of course, many of you will know by now that XRX folded, so Stitches has gone away. There's a lot of mixed feelings around this. Some people got burned. All of us, I think, are very sad. Stitches has occupied a simply wonderful place in my life for the years that I've attended. I'm just very sad to see it go, and I'm sorry also because XRX was one of the absolute top shelf, pardon the horrible pun, book publishers, that their books were known for really great topics, incredible clarity, and fantastic and thoughtful photography of each project. So I don't know if there's a way to fill that gap in my life, but by golly, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, and I say we are going to fill that gap as best we can in our humble way with CFR number nine. Now this has a few reverberations in terms of the podcast. I'm going to add in the segment I used to have on the cognitive fiber retreat. And on that place in the show notes, you will be able to see who we have for attendees I will not use full names, but I want you to be able to tell that you are there if you have reserved a space or if you are waitlisted. Within about six hours of me posting on Instagram that I was going to do the fiber retreat, I had four vendors and I think 14, 16 people, something like that. So that's before we even publicize, so I have a lot of hope for this. I have to tell you that what I learned when I did the first CFR in 2008 I was scared out of my mind. I just was faking it. I wasn't at all sure how to arrange a fiber retreat. But I just kept saying to myself, if you build it, they will come. As in Field of Dreams, the great movie, you know. And that is what happened. Every year at CFR, the Cognitive Fiber Retreat, I was turning away people. I was turning away vendors. The saddest thing about it is in our eighth year, which I think was 2016, all the vendors were great that I always would have every year there'd be one vendor who would get out of line and I had to kind of get rid of them and we finally got to a point where we had this really nice bunch of vendors that everybody behaved and there are some rules around CFR and vending and there are some rules around CFR and attendance and they're happy rules they're going to make everybody happy And anybody who has been to a CFR will tell you this, that we had a lot of fun and a lot of good times. There, as far as I know, there there are a handful of people I won't be having back because they had difficulty with behavior, but I'm not really worried about them. I haven't heard from them in years. And the whole goal here is CFR is meant to be supportive and friendly and loving. And that carries through to the vendors, to the way we do classes, to everything. So there will be a CFR segment from here on in. 
before I get to that, let me do the rest of my normal top of the podcast business. First of all, your comments are very welcome. You can comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com or you can comment over on our group, Cognitive Podcast, on Ravelry. Either place is great. I monitor them every week. By the way, if you notice I sound funny, I have a cold, but I'm getting over it remarkably quickly. I think the excitement of planning a CFR is to blame for that. In the warm thanks, Chris Ah, she seems to enjoy sewing, Seinfeld, and plagiarism. Okay, I don't even know why I wrote that last one, because it's been about 10 days since I looked at my notes. But anyway, we know the first two. She loves sewing in Seinfeld. And she wants you all to know that there's actually an account on Twitter, and I put the link in the show notes, that speculates what contemporary plots for the Seinfeld show would be if the show had continued. Meanwhile, Sal Pal, I want you to know that I've never had to line my flannel skirts because they don't stick to my legs or to my leggings. Now, these smaller skirts, they're not full circles. My other flannel skirts originally were full circles. So they were so big, they didn't stick. With these slightly smaller diameter skirts, I don't know. They may be sticking, we'll find out. But they're okay. The advantage is with the gathered waistband, the way the gathers work, is they kind of push the fabric away from your legs. It's this weird sort of benefit to it. So, so far, so good. I haven't had to wear slips or to line the skirts. It's not a hard thing to do to line a skirt. I made a cape years ago and I lined it. You just get lining fabric and you just, you know, the shiny nylon type thing, and you just cut out the same pieces. And then when you're done, you make an, uh, the double of the thing you want to line. And then when you're done, you just turn them inside out and sew them together. It's not a hard thing to do. But hopefully I'm not going to do that. I am currently enjoying a lot of quilting cotton. I say in my notes that I'm looking at quilting cotton for some easy summer skirts because it is wildly on sale here. I did give in and buy some, so those will be appearing in later episodes. Okay, a drum roll please. It is time to talk about Cognitive Fiber Retreat 2023. It is a one-day event, Saturday, November 11th. The list of attendees are, is up to 17 as I record this. I am number one on the list, however, I may become a vendor. I'm thinking about making chatelaines and offering some for sale. I may be stash busting, I don't know. I don't want to compete though with the dyers, so if I do anything I'm likely to do the chatelaines. But at any rate, there's 17 of us so far out of 50. As our possible vendors, now everybody here on this list is trying to commit. But you have to be real that I don't have a venue, so I can't hold them to this. But so far, we have Lisa Susie Yarns, Oink Pigments, Tina, you remember Jorista, those of you who've been there before? She's bringing soaps to sell, and Laser Sheep Yarns. Let me tell you the ground rules here. Normally, I want people to have one specialty item that they sell that nobody else has because I want everybody to succeed. The only exceptions I've ever made were for the indie dyers and sometimes the indie bag makers. And the reason is we had a lot of years where people sold out their booths completely. I do remember the first year and the second year because we had new vendors both times. The first year we had local dyers, and with the exception of Redfish, they sold out completely. The second year, we brought in some new dyers, and they sold out completely. I have been told by some of the dyers that they did better at a CFR than they did at Stitches West, when you look at their cost of travel, the cost of the booth, and setup, and everything else. So our, our vendors have done really, really well. The other thing is, we are not going to fight. The reason we have that rule, I'm looking for everybody to have that one thing that's special, is because there isn't going to be competition. I will not tolerate it. Starting the first year, every year I had to eject a vendor because somebody got aggressive with the other vendors. We will not tolerate that. I have to be clear, but I have to tell you too, with Lisa, Susan, and the ever-faithful husband, Rod, 
and oink pigments and Tina and laser sheep, these are not people who are going to be that way. I'm not expecting any problem. If we go on with these four vendors, I'm going to be as happy as I can be because your yarny dreams are going to come true. I know these people. I trust these people. So I am just over the moon, and we'll see who comes back. I have not yet contacted any of the previous vendors. I have to look them up and see if they're willing to come. But I am not worried. I am not inviting back anybody who causes trouble. The same is true for the attendees. We had really good luck with attendees. I think, I think we did it eight times, and I think in year seven. We had one person who just got out of line, and that person is gone, and I'm not expecting that person to come back. If that person does, they aren't getting in, as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, it's only the people who are on the list. The other thing you need to realize, this is closed. We are not open for all the neighborhood to come in and shop the vendors. The vendors have been and will again be advised of this. We had a problem. We tried that one year and what we had was basically theft. We had people shoplifted from. We let people from the hotel come in because one of the vendors had asked us and I thought, well, why not? We're all here. And we had serious shoplifting. So we aren't letting in outsiders. We are a good group of people, we are friends, and we are doing this for many reasons. One of the reasons we are doing this is to keep our indie dyers going. We need them. We don't want to be dependent on Joanne Fabrics or Knit Picks for all our yarn. That would be a little bit horrifying. So we are protecting our vendors, but to do that also, we are not opening the floor, the vending floor, to outsiders as far as I can tell. We did it once, we had a bad experience. So if you are a vendor and you are listening and that influences your decision, that's fine by me. But we're not gonna ever do that again as far as I'm concerned. Okay, the other thing is the atmosphere is friendly and loving and mutually supportive. We are there for each other. This is a retreat, CFR, Cognitive Fiber Retreat. So I sound really dictatorial, don't I? Don't you love this tone of voice? This is what you get from teaching Shakespeare in crowded lecture halls for a few years. You know, I know I sound a little bit rough here, but you know, try to bear with me. I'm just laying down the rules now. We have always had a wonderful environment. The atmosphere has always been great. We are there for each other. We are there to have a great time. Now, the thing that's not on here are classes. We did have classes. If you teach a class at CFR, you get free admission. Now, let's talk about admission. What does your admission get you? It gets you a raffle ticket. This is for the people who are attendees. I'm not talking to the vendors here. Your admission gets you a raffle ticket. The raffle prizes will be coming from the vendors, and I may go trolling, if I have time, on Etsy to see if anybody will donate, but I'm not sure if I'm going to do that anymore. We'll see. A lot of people did send coupons, though. We used to have little goodie bags. I don't know. I have to see. Those details are not ironed out yet. But don't worry, the first CFR was arranged in 30 days, so I'm pretty sure I can arrange this one in six months. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so you got a raffle ticket. What else did you get? You got a day of fun and access privately to all these vendors. What else do you get? You get me. Because basically your admission pays for my hotel room. That's it. This is a non-profit. I'm not making money off this. I don't want to deal with the IRS. So essentially, I accept payment for my hotel room. What is that likely to be? Mm, as far as I can tell right now, about, depending on the admission fee, I would think like one to three dollars of your admission fee. So you know what that means? That's right, not a big admission fee. Now, what do we do with the money from your admission if I have extra? That is a reasonable question. I shop our vendors, and then I raffle those things off. So the idea is everything you spend on CFR is circling back to CFR for your enjoyment. And that does include my, my hotel room. I mean, you need me there to make things run, guys. Let's be real. But you need to realize this is not for profit. I'm not taking money off you. So what did we charge for admission in previous years? I have to go look it up. I think the first year was 10 bucks. I think eventually we might have gotten to 20 or 25. And 
I, I'm not anticipating it to be much, but there is one thing we may, well, it's two things. Ugh. We may have to pay for it. One is liability insurance on the space. I have to talk to the people at the hotel to see what their interest is there. The second is for the space, that the banqueting room may not come free. Now, before I had a deal with the hotel that if I sold X number of rooms, they would give us the banqueting space for free. So I'm going to look for that. Will I get that? I'm not sure. But that is going to have a lot to do with the cost of your admission. As I said, this is a non-profit. The vendors, what does it cost for you? Usually we're looking for a high quality skein of yarn. Okay, so in previous years I would say something that a retail price for it would be $25. I'm probably going to make that $30 or $35 because prices have gone up, but that will get raffled at the very beginning of the day, so everybody is going to see the vendor's yarns right away in the morning. What does a CFR look like? Well, here's what it's supposed to be. Saturday morning you get up, you have breakfast, you come downstairs, and we have a meeting, usually at 9 a.m., by the pool, used to be. I don't know where we're going to be this year. We used to be at the La Quinta, which no longer exists, by the way, in Tehachapi. So we're not going to be there. Okay, so we used to have the meeting by the pool. We'd go around, we'd introduce ourselves, and you could say anything you wanted to. And then we would raffle off the goodies. And then I would make any announcements, and then we would go inside and we would shop. Because we want to give the vendors time. Classes varied somewhat. They'd start at 10 or 11 or 10.30, depending on what we had. And then we would go for lunch, I think usually around noon or 1. We'd have a two-hour lunch break. And everybody would buddy up and drive to local restaurants. And then we'd come back. We'd do the afternoon classes. What about the vendors, you say? Well, we ask our vendors as part of the deal, since this is so inexpensive, we ask them to stay until 5 p.m. Why? Because you should be able to walk out of a class and say, oh my god, I'm really inspired by this class and I need this certain type of gear, yarn, whatever. You should be able to walk out to a vendor and find it. That works for the vendors and it works for the attendees. Now, what did the vendors do about this? Well, I had to throw a few out because they tried to leave early or they complained. But most of the vendors brought their spinning wheels and frankly, they sat around in the vending space in the banqueting hall and they just all uh, spun together and chatted. So, you know, it was a social event for them. Okay, so at five o'clock we wound it all up. Now that's what the official schedule was. What really happened? People showed up on Fridays, everybody hugged, people set up spinning wheels in the hallways, everybody was out in the hall spinning and chatting. Then they opened the banqueting room for us because nobody else was using it anyway because we were in a remote mountain town. So we'd go in the banqueting room and we'd all sit there and spin and chat and knit and whatever. Then Saturday would happen, as I've described it. Saturday night, we would all buddy up, go to dinner again. And then we'd go back to the banqueting room, and we'd be spinning and knitting whatever again. And we had treats, and, you know, people brought pastries and goodies and whatnot. I would think the most integral, unofficial part of CFR was on Sunday, we used to go to a local greasy spoon, all of us, anybody who wanted to come. And we had sort of an open chat on what could be done better. I did try to take people seriously, although I, I had over and over, I had one person, who I doubt will show, who used to agitate, we need a different venue. Now, in the end we did, we had a bed bug incident, and that has dictated we wouldn't be going back to La Quinta. But, except for that, where that person had a, had absolutely right on case, yes, we shouldn't go back, and as it turned out, we didn't. But. No, the other person who had the thing about the venue, I, I think, was just acting out because she needed to. I don't know. Needed to let off steam. But the idea was we had an open meeting. Anybody could come, a brunch, on Sunday morning because I wanted feedback. And I wanted you to have to face me when you say it. That, in other words, it's important when you give feedback to remember this was a goodwill effort. I gave freely of my time, and the only pay I took was my room so I could be on site and keep things running which I think is pretty fair, to be honest. But I didn't take pay for this, okay? So if you're gonna give me feedback, you need to remember that this is a huge act of charity that usually takes months to plan. So I need you to temper yourself even if something goes wrong. And things occasionally did. 
but we had a good time together, and I think people remember CFR with fondness. The most common question I've gotten since I started this podcast is, will you please start up CFR again? Well, it seems your wish was my command. Thank you, XRX. That's one of the few bright sides to that cloud. So that's how CFR works. Venues I'm looking at. I don't believe we're going back to Tehachapi. The deal I had with the La Quinta, well, first of all, the La Quinta is gone. It's been replaced by a Wyndham Hotel on the same site. It's the same building, everything's the same. It had some significant advantages. Small town, you could walk back and forth to the restaurant area, such as it was, Starbucks locally. I mean, there was a lot of hanging out space up there, and it was off the map. Bad news, it's a prison town. On weekends, you get inmates, families. We didn't have a problem with that till the last year, but we did have a problem with it in the last year. So other places I've been looking. Lancaster and Palmdale in the Antelope Valley. Would you believe this? Too expensive. Prices are comparable to the coast. I can't imagine that in a month of Sundays. I looked at Camarillo, Ventura, Thousand Oaks. Very pricey. And one of the philosophies of Cognitive has been to try to keep it less expensive. I looked at Simi Valley. Prices are better, but nothing there. Just a big, hot, flat... Yeah. So I looked at closer to home, and I looked at Castaic, San Fernando, Santa Clarita, and Valencia. That's looking promising. I have a few potential places. But I do not want us to spend 200 bucks a night for a room. For one thing, because that's going to cost you a lot to put me up. That's going to raise your, your admission price. Yeah, okay, by, you know, two bucks. But even so, so we don't want to do that. We want a, uh, we want a friendly hotel that's low-key and not overcrowded and not too, as Jane Austen would say, high in the instep. I want it to be a casual, informal event. So that's what we have so far on CFR 2023. Please circle the date on your calendar. You can see if your name is on the attendees list. And if it's not, you should contact me. All right, what is on my hooks and needles? Well, on my sewing needles, my machine's needle, I actually did some shorts. This is Simplicity Pattern 8558. These came out great at the waist and butt and just too wide down the thighs. You know, when you're my age, your body just doesn't fit store-bought sizes. It kind of does whatever the heck it wants. Mine seems to be sliding from the top down into my hips and up from the thighs into my hips. At any rate, there are the shorts. They are in a plain cotton polyester broadcloth. Let me explain to you that when you make shorts, it's mind bending because you have to work in three dimensions. So I did a lot of ripping out. My favorite moment here was when I took one of the sides of the pockets and sewed it onto the bottom hem of the left leg. Why did you do that, Gemma? Damned if I know. I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought it had all lined up when I pinned it together. That was pretty rude. But at any rate, you can see they worked out just fine despite an enormous amount of ripping out and messing up. And they're very comfortable. And the cotton was on sale for like four bucks a yard. I missed it by one day. They were selling it for two bucks a yard. That was what I was really going for. Nonetheless, I did buy some darker blue and we'll be making shorts out of that too. And I'm looking for the short pattern of my dreams. This may be it, but it's not quite right. I'm also looking to mess with the waistband a little bit so that instead of using three channels of half inch elastic, I can use a one inch band, and that's not really hard to do. You just need to mess with your idea of how you make the waistband casing. Not a hard thing. I also finished those other two flannel skirts I was telling you about last week. There they are. I'm wearing both of them. On the left, you can see the turtles. On the right, you can see the watermelons. I'm wearing a pretty sloppy shirt with them. I want you to know these came out great. I've been wearing them to work every day. I'm currently wearing the turtles as I record this. I did finish one of the Hooberry socks. There it is in all its TARDIS blue glory. And, can you believe this? I also finished the Spring Frankie's socks. And, I have to tell you, they look better in person than they do in that picture. And so I'm very, very happy about all this finishing. 
In the meantime, you betcha, I didn't want to do any more Frankies, so of course I started another pair. Those are the Mother's Day Frankies, because that's when I started it. The Blueberry Who socks, I'm well into sock number two. I'm about halfway down the leg. I do them from top down. The Dizzy Woodlands Country Cotton Shawl, I just, when I get the urge, I go in there and I sort of push out another row or two of that. So that's got a ways to go, but I'm enjoying it. And no love on anything else, including the Lane Splitter and the Don't Know Yet, the Pennsylvania Dutch Embroidery, and the Lady Eleanor. They're just all piled at my feet when I sit in the study, which I'm not doing now because I'm in the car. In my favorite resources, we are looking at Lisa Souza and Dizzy Blonde. Dizzy Blonde is not going to vent for us because she's in Florida. And she comes out once a year to do Knit Disney out of Disneyland, which is like a day-long event where they all knit in the parking lot and then go in and ride things together. And that's by Labor Day, so we're not competing with Knit Disney in any way. Laura wants to make us a signature colorway, and I'm, I'm good with that. And if you want to see her stuff, you know, you can see her stuff right there. I have a link. And I have a link for Lisa Sousa. So you can probably tell I'm going to add the links for Laser Sheep and Oink. By the way, if you're a vendor, what do you get out of this? I'm going to promote you on my podcast. I'm going to put you in my links list. I'm going to do anything I can. I don't take money for advertising. I don't have a huge listenership, but it's a few thousand people. And so I'm going to spread the word about you. And I'm going to use your products and talk about your products on the podcast. So that's what you get. Dizzy Blondes, that is my spinning. Not much. Uh, I'm still doing the fuzzballs of Minerva. I've got like six of them piled up on my desk. It's a little tragic. And now, gasping for breath, a strategy. We're doing mindfulness. And I'm going to say, right here, right now, the two most basic elements of mindfulness. But somehow I've managed not to say. And they are look and listen. Specifically, when we talk about mindfulness, we're usually thinking about ourselves. How am I being mindful? How am I observing my actions and maintaining a certain set of values through my actions. But mindfulness is also about observing the other. And so one of the things I want to tell you is what I've learned as a clinician. I learned this in the prison most of all, but I also learned it treating children. It's very important to look at people and to see what you can see as you approach them, particularly if you're going to make a request, especially if it's a request you think they won't like. You need to learn to see the other person. What do I mean by that? I mean very specific stuff. First of all, as they walk towards you, how do they walk? Are they healthy? Are they in pain? Are they limping? Are they comfortable? That gets overlooked all the time. If somebody is limping up to you and you're going to ask them for something, they're not happy. They're starting from a not happy place. You probably want to try to meet that with sympathy and kindness. You don't want to just launch into whatever it is that's on your mind. You want to actually see them. You want to look at their clothing. Are they disheveled? Are they organized? What's the quality of their clothing? Is it well made? Did they make it themselves? Which, by the way, may mean it's very well made in my situation. So you want to look at them. You can learn a lot from them by looking at the way they dress. Are they original? Are they creative? Are they kind of crafty or artsy? You're going to see that in the way they dress. Are they disorganized? Are they unhappy? You know, how are they wearing their clothes? Are their clothes clean? Most of the time, I think most of us would say we're encountering people in clean clothes. But, you know, there are always exceptions. So you want to look at how they're dressed. Look at their hair. Is their hair organized? Is it disheveled? Look at the expression on their face. But also, Look at their eyes. Are their eyes bright? Are their eyes attentive? Are they looking at you? Do they have bags under their eyes? Do they look tired? You might want to think about that when you're talking to them. A tired person is harder to communicate with successfully. So how do they look? Do they have gray bags under their eyes? What about the muscles of their face? Is their face lax? Is it slack? Older people, and I hate to say this, we lose muscle tone in our faces. I have noticed it in my face. As you age, your face sort of sags. It's kind of horrifying. But you want to look at that, too, because they may not have as much expression 
as another person who has better facial tone. So you want to pay attention to this stuff. When people walk up to you, you want to really take them in and see what kind of reception are you going to get and what kind of reception can you give? Can you be nice to them? Do they need you to be kind? Do they need you to approach them gently? The other thing you need to do, you need to listen. You need to listen. If they're with a group of people, listen to their tone of voice. Listen to how they walk away from the group. Are they friendly? Are they happy? When they walk up to you, you want to listen to how they talk to you. You listen to their tone of voice. What you learn from teaching Shakespeare is you want to listen to the rhythms of their speech. Okay? And this is key. I'm going to give you the easy examples. Hamlet when he's thinking about suicide, so we can all assume that's pretty unhappy, he sounds like this. To be or not to be, that is the question. Da dun da dun da dun da dun da dun da Okay? Staccato. Single syllable words. So the audience here is da dun da dun da dun da dun da dun da dun Okay? They know there's a problem. I have seen it badly delivered where they tried to be thoughtful. To be or not to be no. No, that's ridiculous. These are short monosyllables. That's a staccato rhythm. Actors do not do well when they don't pay attention to what the greatest playwright of Western Europe is teaching them by his actual diction. Now, you take another speech. You take Portia in Merchant of Venice. When she's in court pretending to be a male lawyer, and a case has been made that one man should be able to literally cut the heart of another man out in the courtroom in front of everybody. Portia's got to think about this one. This is going to be a challenge. Because even though nobody wants to do it, the law says you have to. So Portia turns to the man who could cut out the heart, Shylock, and she's trying to reason with him. So she says, the quality of mercy is not strained. In this case, constrained. That is, you can't force the quality of mercy. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. Okay, listen to the pace. Da 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 No staccato. Notice the diction. The gentle rain. It droppeth. She keeps slowing her speech down and invoking softness and softer values. Learn something from Shakespeare. You hear as an audience what the other person's pace and rhythm sound like. Somebody comes up to you and goes, I can't talk to you right now, I'm really good. You hear it? Da -da 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 you need to listen. You need to pay attention to that. That matters. It matters for us. When a patient comes in and they're talking like that, first job, we gotta calm them down and slow them down if we can. Okay, so when you are being mindful, I want you to be mindful of the other person, and I want you to take that five seconds that changes everything to really look at them, how they look, how they're presenting, and to really hear them. How are they talking to other people when they separate to talk to you, and how are they talking to you? Listen to rhythm. Look for details. Okay. In the fluffy books, nothing new there. I did finish An Extravagant Duplicity by Lynn Messina. She's apparently got another one coming out in the fall, which makes me happy. I like the Beatrice Hyde Clare series. They're not perfectly written, but they're interesting. And she's now writing the Verity Lark series that kind of interlocks with that. She's got another one of those. The second one, A Lark's Flight. The first one is A Lark's Tale. She has, A Lark's Flight is coming out on June 2nd. Netflix, I was watching Seinfeld, I took a bit of a break. I'm currently watching Queen Charlotte. I have the same problems with Queen Charlotte that I had with Bridgerton. It is very compelling and I'm enjoying it, but I feel conflicted because when you try to do an interracial regency, that's good, that's good to see, but the problem is you're kind of, pardon the expression, whitewashing over the slavery that supported the wealth of the English nobility in those days. So it's kind of hard to take because once you bring people of color into the nobility, you're implying that they're willing to make their money off slavery. That's pretty uncomfortable for me. 
and they keep saying in the introduction, hey, it's only fiction. I know. But unfortunately, a lot of history is written by white people is also fiction. I refer you to Gone with the Wind and their happy slaves. Okay, so again, I'm really uneasy whenever we cover the history of slavery this way. And it is a shame because this is compelling stuff. It's also very sympathetic to mental illness, as far as I can tell. So yeah, like I said, I have a lot of conflicted feelings on this one, but you know, I've watched a few episodes. Something I really like, however, is Tannis Gray, who just won't stop putting out great books. Now, I told you last week she's releasing a book on Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Knit, I believe she's calling it. Well, she's also releasing on September 26th, the Disney Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas, the official knitting guide to Halloween Town and Christmas. Oh, Tannis Gray. Oh, Tannis Gray. Oh, Tannis Gray. Oh, Tannis Gray. Okay, I'm sorry. She said Christmas. My brain went there. I think it's, I think it's like 27. I can't read it. I've got the listing from Amazon. Let's face it. I'm going to buy both those books. I'm just waiting for the next paycheck. Also, I've been telling you about my wonderful circle skirt pattern. I found it. I found it. It is Simplicity, number 8863, one hour bottoms. Now, it says it is size is 6 through 16. Pretty darn good. I have to tell you, I don't know what size I am, but I know they still fit me, and I don't believe I'm a 16. So what's going on there? Well, the waistband casing, I measured it for this skirt. Yeah. 42 inches around. So what really happens there? You make the skirt, you put on the casing. You don't pull your elastic as tight. What can I tell you? So, you know, this thing looks like it's going to fit me. And will I be making more circle skirts? I certainly have five yards of micro suede, so we'll see if I can. I also bought it because it's got shorts. And knowing as I do the width of the casing, I want to look at those shorts because they look a little more fitted than the ones I just made put a lid on it. The tea tastings continue. I'm looking at all the Get Well teas in the Plum Deluxe line because I've got a sore throat right now. So I don't have anything new to say there about. Let's see what else I have. I have the Blather. Can I finish it? Well, I've already told you that XRX has shuttered and is no longer with us. ASL, we presented our art projects last week, last Wednesday night. It was more fun than I expected. Everybody had a good time. We were all supportive of each other. We we're all cheering each other on. My scarf went over really well. I got to talk about Amishness, deafness, deaf Amishness, <laughs> spinning, weaving, and using your own pets in your scarves. It was pretty exciting. The pup date. Captain and Queenie are doing well. Captain remains on steroids for her discoid lupus in her nose. We saw the vet on Monday, she cut back on the steroids, but we're still going forward with that, and it's helping. The hub state, well, the sun brought home a cold on Friday. He was really miserable with it Friday and Saturday. Sunday, the hubs was miserable. Mother's Day was a little weird. They were both trying to nobly be there for me, but both were sick. I got roses, I got chocolates, we had lunch out together. I'd like to apologize to everybody in BJ's of Valencia as we were there because they were sick. And I woke up Monday with the cold, but I'm doing a great job getting over it right now. So go figure, we're all getting over our colds. On the calendar, the Cognitive Fiber Retreat is on Saturday, November 11th, 2023. The Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference is in Anaheim, December 12th through 17th, 2023. Minerva gets the last word. You can see her there, sitting thoughtfully on the corner of my desk, pondering the floor, with her ears laid back somewhat thoughtfully. And what is Minerva saying? She's saying, should I risk it? Should I do it again? Curiously, she's channeling me, because she's thinking, do we need another cognitive? We did it eight times. Should we do it again? The answer is yes. Should I risk it? Yes, risk it. Take the chance. Even if I don't get this right, even if it's not perfect, even if we discover a whole new set of problems to have, it's worth trying. I had a lot of fun at CFR. A lot of us had a lot of fun. It was a place of great goodwill. So should I risk it? Minerva would tell you, go for it. If you keep searching in the garage long enough, you're sure to find a mouse. 
if you build a fiber retreat, people will come do it. So should I risk it? Well, I'm going to, and we're going to go for it. You may be aware that the, the PHE, the Public Health Emergency, ended on May 11th. So what does that mean? It means the pandemic seems to be officially over. We're going to see there's going to be some shaking out afterwards to see what kind of details come out of this. So I don't know how my life is going to change. I don't know if I'm going to have to go back into the office or where we're going. I don't see a reason for that change to happen. I have plenty of patients happy to see me from their homes. So I don't know where we're going to go with this or how it's going to work out. But it's exciting and I'm still going to tell you when you're in public and people are sick around you or it's flu season, wear a mask. Try to stay a little more distant from people. If you don't want to get sick, wash your hands. You know that, right? Get all your shots. You know that, right? Of course you do. Get your family all their shots. I guess I'm going to say welcome back to the normal. But remember, we are a community. So when we help each other, we help ourselves. And that means I want everybody to stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.